Hello, my name is Bob Barker. I'm one of the managing partners of Barker Gilmore. And thanks for joining today's uh, GC Advantage webinar. Um, we have uh, with us today uh, a couple uh, experts in this area, um, and I'll introduce them in a minute. Um, but uh, I think you're going to get a lot out of today, and this is a, is a very hot topic, as uh, you know, many legal departments and boards are looking at um, you know who should be responsible. Uh, we have some information to share with you, also kind of who who is responsible today, um, based upon some surveys we've done, um, and so we look forward to sharing some some great information with you. Um, and we have. Uh, Again, just as this is um, this program is is part of our GC Advantage program, um, and uh, for, for those of you who um, you know uh, want to be kept aware of what's coming up, uh, you can go to that website. And uh, a couple of the ones coming up here is uh, competitors can be friends. Uh, why GCs and competitive industries can and should work together. Um, it's going to be a really interesting session. Uh, we have Noah Hamp who was the, the former general counsel of MasterCard, um, as well as Joss uh, Florum. He's the former general counsel of Visa. So two direct competitors and basically how they work together um, you know, throughout the years. Um, and then in May, we have uh, another topic, balancing the roles of business partner um, and manager of legal risk. Um, so everybody uh, struggles with that over time. And we have um, Helen Pudlin, uh, the former uh, GC of PNC Financial leading that. Uh, she'll have uh, Greg Jordan, uh, the current general counsel, chief administrative officer of uh, PNC, as well as Ann Harlan uh, and um, Mike Williams on our team uh, participate. And as a former general counsel of um, uh, Jam Sch uh, Smuckers, and uh, Mike is a uh, former general counsel of Staples. Um, we also have a library of um, uh, former web webinars, um, on-demand webinars, so uh, you can, can view those. Uh, this um, session will be recorded. It'll be published in about three to four weeks, um, along with an executive summary. And everybody that's attending today will be notified via email once that information is posted. Uh, and um, we'll also, we also include information just, uh, so, you, so you can get a link to it in our uh, monthly newsletter. Um, as far as uh, questions, uh, feel free to, to submit those during the session. And um, some, some we may get to during the actual session versus you know, we may you know, have others that we, we uh, save to the end. Um, and when you click on the, the Q&A uh, button within the, the Zoom app, uh, if there are other questions uh, that are similar, then you can just give it a thumbs up and that will push that, you know, let um, uh, Audrey and team know that that's a, a high interest uh, to, uh, to everyone in the group here. And uh, that'll be on the top of their list. Um, I think... That is it for me. Um, at this point, I'll turn it over to Audrey. And uh, uh, Audrey, thanks for, for leading this today. Uh, and uh, like I said, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. It's my pleasure, Bob. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, and as the listeners or viewers can see and hear, uh, I'm so honored to be part of Barker Gilmore. What a team. You just heard of several impressive, wonderful GCs who are going to be doing future programs. So I am a senior advisor with Barker Gilmore. <clears throat> in the past, I've been a general counsel. I've been a partner in a law firm. Uh, and I actually teach the changing business of law at the University of Illinois College of Law. Uh, my, in, in the past, in the recent past, I was the vice president and chief operating officer of the global law department of Aon Corporation. And I'm so delighted to have with me uh, Greg Wilkinson and Kim Metrick, uh, who have varied and interesting experiences with ESG. Greg, can you give us a one minute highlights on, on your position in your career? Sure, absolutely, Audrey, and, and thanks for uh, uh, inviting me on. Um, so 
I am the current general counsel, uh, also chief compliance officer and global head of HR for Electrorent. Uh, we are the world's largest provider of electrical test and measurement equipment for rental. Um, in my capacity, um, I'm in charge of our ESG efforts. Um, I've played similar roles uh, in, in a couple different industries. Uh, I've worked in a lot of uh, technology companies, both hardware and software, along with some um, uh, professional service roles. And uh, always had the opportunity to either partner uh, with uh, different departments such as HR or COOs um, in SG efforts and, and really see the value that they bring to, you know, uh, solid business governance and uh, business operations and results. So real pleasure to be here with you, Audrey. Thank you. Kim, you want to give us the headlines? Hi, everyone. I'm Kim Metrick, and I'm Vice President of Employment Law, Legal Operations, and Investigations with uh, Walgreens Boots Alliance. Uh, this is my 27th year with the company, so I've been with the company for a very long time and always had a passion for ESG, in particular in the employee uh, health and safety and employee working condition space, but work very closely with our CSR team to uh, lead the initiatives and just so happy to be here today as well. Thank you. So to kick it off, <clears throat> we have a couple of, of data points for you. I'm kind of a big believer in data as proving the point. Uh, so um, there was a, a vast report done uh, recently by uh, Corporate Secretary in IR Magazine. Um, and in, it showed that U.S. companies saw record numbers of environmental and social shareholder proposals in 2021, a record number. 59% of corporate governance professionals agreed that the company's board members have a high level involvement high level of involvement with overseeing ESG. We know this is a hot topic. It is becoming hotter. And while in the past, people uh, you know, concentrated on topics that uh, were called uh, you know, the board of directors or corporate governance or uh, DEI and J, uh, we now know almost all of that, so much of that can be rolled up into ESG. Um, and, and Barker Gilmore did a study uh, very recently uh, that is fascinating because it shows um, that uh, in, in the majority of companies that we surveyed, uh, the GC CLO did have the ultimate responsibility for ESG, which is very interesting because typically GCs don't really talk about their ESG role as in their feature of what they do. And then finally, we have a uh, we did a survey um, that showed that, um, and it's going to come out next week, published that um, asking boards around the country what their uh, most important areas of risk are, the things that they go to the GC the most for. ESG was fourth. It was actually above data privacy. So it really is uh, a, hot, a hot and important topic for the companies. Um, so having, having, having said that, um, I'd like to ask Kim and Greg, you both mentioned in general what your roles are at your companies with ESG. But I'd like you to talk about who runs ESG for your companies and how your roles with ESG uh, interact. Now, Greg, I'm gonna start with you because you said you're actually in charge of ESG. And so I'd like to know um, something more about um, what is the kind of scope of your involvement, your leadership involvement with ESG for your company, Electro Rent. Sure, absolutely. So, um, for, first of all, I, I think it's important to understand, um, you know, as, as the GC, I do lead the ESG effort, but it's it's really a team play, right? So it's not it's not something that just exists in legal. And and, and I mentioned I also um, oversee HR. It's, it's not something just rests in those two departments. Um, I coordinate very closely with our COO, right? I'll, I'll, particularly on the environmental side, it's very important that you know we're we're doing the right thing environmentally. And, and obviously his folks play a, a large part in that. So 
really the the the, the way this works out, um, at least you know, with, with the companies I've worked in and currently here at Electrorent, is is we really try and form a true partnership, right? So so I'm in charge of leading the initiatives, but it becomes very much a a team effort to ensure that you know. We're, we're setting appropriate metrics, right? That, that's very important. Um, our CEO happens to be very data-driven, very metric-driven, right? So, so he asks, you know, each of us, you know, what are we doing? How do we show results? Um, and I think that's one of the very important parts when it comes to ESG, right? Because some of the concepts are a little amorphous, right? But having actual metrics and, and being able to produce, you know, improvements to those metrics and, and really drive, is a very important factor when you look at your ESG program. So, so one of the things I'm responsible for is establishing what are the appropriate metrics to use. And, and obviously we can go very far in depth on that one. Um, this is only an hour webinar, so I'll try and keep it somewhat high level. But as a good example, you know, if, if, if we look at, for example, just the S, right, with social um, responsibility, um, particularly with the DE and I efforts, right, what are our actual uh, metrics that we're looking, you know, what, what's our candidate you know, ratio mix that we're looking for? What is the, the percentage of hires based off of the various, you know, uh, diversity um, type categories? What are our efforts? How are we reaching out to diversity partners, right? Not just traditional recruiting methods like, oh, hey, I po posted a, a job on Monster or LinkedIn, but, you know, are you going to, as an example, you know, historical black colleges? Are you looking for, you know, very specific targeted industry groups like, and, and I'm just making this up, but, you know, the electrical, Engineer Association for uh, Asian Americans. What are you doing to really, you know, put forth those efforts? And and we 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 basically developed a set of metrics for each of the E, the S, and the G categories. Um, so so that was the primary, you know, kind of uh, initial thing we did. And and where I really kind of stepped to the forefront was I really took an in depth look at each of those areas and what are the results that we wanted to drive. And then from there, it's partnering, like I said, with our internal business partners, be they the COO or, or you know, your HR folks to understand, okay, how do we accomplish, you know, what's the plan to get there? And, and you really have to flow it down from, you know, top to bottom, just like with any, you know, strategic goal. Well, what are your enabling objectives to get to that goal? What are the steps? So, so that's kind of the approach, you know, I took here at Electra and, and, and that's really started to show some significant results and, and also helps keep people on track because, uh, again, unless you have very specific actions people take, right? It's it's one of those things where you know you can kind of feel like you're doing something, but you're really not sure what the next step is or how, how does it play in. So, um, I, I strongly encourage the folks that the the sooner you can kind of map out, you know, what that ESG plan looks like, particularly around metrics that you can track yourself to, that's probably one of the first steps I'd recommend. Thank you, Kim. Oh, how do you participate in and lead ESG for Walgreens Boots? So there is a director of CSR and a whole team of individuals cross-functionally that uh, lead the effort, but um, legal is uh, an integral, you know, plays an integral role in this as well, particularly with respect to um, any of the, in my uh, role, any of the employee or supplier diversity data points that we are uh, looking to drive within our CSR agenda. So if you can imagine, and it's, I agree with you, it's very data driven. So from a material, material materiality perspective, um, there will be you know certain data points that we prioritize as a company. We do that through internal and external surveying. And within those data points, as you can imagine, employee uh, working conditions and diversity, equity, and inclusion are prioritized within our company as well. And that's where uh, my role helps to really uh, drive synergy and helps to really develop what that action plan is. How are we going to develop meaningful goals that we can all kind of drive uh, towards, uh, but do that in a way that really helps to build and drive success. Well, so uh, you mentioned CSR and for some of our viewers and listeners, could you uh, tell us what that means, please? Oh, sure. Corporate social responsibility. So um, it's interesting because I think that term is now kind of evolving into ESG, but uh, the individual that uh, in our company uh, drives this work is our uh, corporate social responsibility director. Well, your corporate social responsibility director runs your ESG work. 
Um, well, she leads the, you know, the, again, it's a team uh, as sponsored by our CEO, but yes, she is the person who is um, driving that work. So do you think it matters? Um, you have, both of you are in very different industries and your companies are, are structured and owned very differently. But we know based on the research that investors really are starting to ask about and care about ESG. Um, do you think, uh, Kim, it matters if the company is public or private or large or small in uh, whether the GC should get involved in ESG and does get involved in ESG? I actually don't. Um, I think there are certain enhanced expectations with respect to public companies. Uh, that uh, obviously GCs are mindful of, but uh, that role and the impact that that role has um, to advance ESG efforts and really help to uh, provide that leadership um, direction, I, I think translates well, whether you're a private company or a public company. Right? Yeah, and, 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 and I'll just you know, kind of second exactly what Kim said. Um, it really doesn't make a difference if you're public or private. And, and obviously there's a lot of different versions of what private equals, right? Um, just for the sake of it, um, since it's clearly no secret, you know, Electron is actually owned by a, a private equity firm, Platinum Equity. Uh, they, they, they've been very great to us. They, they, they give us a lot of rain in terms of how we manage the business, but obviously, you know, they, they have a business model that we need to fit into. Um, and, and, you know, the ability to to have success and a successful ESG program, I think, really affects all companies. Not just, I mean, obviously, it, it definitely will affect things like access to capital, right? Particularly if if um, you're, you're public, you know, it's something you're going to have to report on. Investors will care about on the private side. You know, you, you'll still have to, particularly with invest, institutional investors, you know, they're going to make sure that you have a successful ESG program if they're going to invest their dollars into your business. Um, so, so it really does drive that. But, but most importantly, and I think fundamentally, ESG is just a very good business practice, regardless of access to capital, regardless of reporting responsibilities. It helps your business run better, right? You know, study after study show that, for example, having a diverse workforce and a diverse, you know, mindset really drives businesses forward. The, the, the inventiveness, the, the, the cross-cultural, the, you know, different ways of viewing things. Um, you know, same with, you know, environmental, you know, companies that are environmentally, you know, sustainable, have a business model, um, they attract a lot of will from the consumer, um, you know, and again, with corporate governance, you know, if, if you don't have good corporate governance, you're going to have a whole bunch of other problems, <laughs> be they, you know, I, I hate to say it, but, um, you know, unfortunately, there's some bad folks out there, you, you, you need to make sure that, you know, we're controlling, you know, how your finances are dealt with, how does the, you know, if it's cash control or anything else, you know, so, so I think it's really important, regardless if you're public, private, or even the size, you know, small company, large company, um, you know, I've worked at, you know, very large companies, you know, HP, for example, I've worked at very small companies, you know, in series A and B funding. It, it's really a, a solid program that helps companies propel their own success. So we talked about the importance of metrics and how the law department uh, and GCs uh, can uh, help move forward the data associated with ESG. Um, I have a thought that um, we can also um, demand uh, and set expectations with our vendors, which are uh, mainly law firms. And so I know uh, I've been putting uh, ESG related specific data questions into our RFPs and expecting uh, uh, report cards back from the firms on that. I know other companies do that as well. Uh, have either of you tried that? Uh, uh, came after you, after you. Okay, well, you know, interestingly, Audrey, we have developed our own internal DEI law firm scorecard that we do ask our preferred providers to complete on an annual basis. Um, we also are um, pursuing Mansfield certification, which is the additional certification that has different requirements with respect to um, law firm uh, leadership expectations and relationship expectations. So we've embedded 
updated all of that. Actually, we just did a refresh of our preferred provider program um, uh, DEI requirements, and we've embedded all of that into our law firm um, uh, requirements as well. So that would then uh, help your ESG metrics as well, correct? Yeah, absolutely. From a supplier diversity perspective, um, you know, we've got majority law firms, but we also have, uh, you know, a commitment with respect to, and we're monitoring legal spend with um, diverse uh, women-owned, minority-owned law firms uh, as well. Thank you, Greg. Anything to add? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I think it's important, and 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 to some degree, you know. I'll say a lot of outside law firms kind of expect to pass on things like this, right? Where it's like, oh, we're a specialized industry, you know, we are who we are. But I think it's important that we hold our outside vendors, including law firms, accountable for ESG efforts, particularly with, you know, DE and I. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan. Uh, when, when I look for, you know, a, a new law firm, you know, if it's a specific, you know, substantial area of law or if it's a different, you know, geography that we've perhaps not operated in before. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm always looking to see, and there's a couple of good, you know, kind of sourcing or, or bulletin board type groups out there that, that really do help promote diversity owned um, law firms, right? So, so you, can, you can easily Google them and, and, and find them, um, but there's a, there's a couple out there that, that, that I kind of go to, and, and it really does help me focus in on, um, you know, allowing to, to build a more diverse base and, and really help promote diversity within that, you know, kind of pool of vendors. So we have a question uh, from the audience that I think is uh, very interesting. Um, and I'm gonna start with you, Greg. Uh, how do you set metrics or develop specific goals for environmental uh, if you're not in a manufacturing business? So what if you were in a, you know, a professional services business like insurance or financial services? How would you get involved in um, improving e ESG, the E part? And I have another related question from this person. Does working at home enter into environmental me metrics? Greg, you want to start on this if you've, if you've paid any attention to it at all? Sure, sure, absolutely. So, so um, I, I think you don't just have to be a manufacturing business or even a business that has products. Um, you know, if, if you're a professional service organization, I, I think there is still an environmental component. For example, there's an ISO cert out there on environmental sustainability. And, and I'm not saying everyone should run out and go get it, right? But the, the idea, for example, is we do a lot of business with the Canadian government, as an example. And they actually require us to have the certification. And, and, and some of the things that the certification deals with are, 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 are very simple, but they're things that any business can do. You know, print on two sides of paper, right? Don't just print a single sided paper. Make sure you're buying recycled paper. Um, you know, do you have, and, and today it's less of an issue, but, you know, are your electronic devices essentially energy smart devices where, you know, they're, they'll shut out after a while? Do you have a corporate policy that, you know, I mean, some of this is just good, you know, security that like your screen locks out after a couple of minutes, right? And then it shuts down in a hybrid mode for when you're ready to come back to work. It saves energy, right? So there's a lot of those types of environmental metrics that you can create or, you know, you know um, set and then track your business to. So it's not just people that make things or even deal with physical products. Um, you, you can go for those other types of environmental metrics that are basically something that, you know, honestly, almost any business, if they have a desire to achieve them, can do so. They're, they're, they're not things that were, they're out of, you know, outer space type, you know, you know nice to haves. There, there are things that are easily attainable. Thank you. And uh, Kim, I'll bet working for a company in the pharma industry, you have a vast uh, uh, scope of environmental uh, metrics and goals that, that you're tasked with. What, what are they? Well, it's interesting because I, I don't know that I'm the leader with respect to how we measure uh, specific environmental goals, but I do know that we use the GRI standard to really help to be our North Star with respect to our reporting. What the Global Reporting Initiative will help do is frame for each type of environmental goal or uh, standard that we are um, pursuing 
there are model metrics around that. So it's actually quite helpful. Um, you know, once a company, once you decide, okay, what's material uh, with respect to your organization and you refine, you know, you take that list and you de determine what uh, metrics you are gonna be measuring yourself on internally, uh, you apply the GRI, uh, GRI standards and that really helps to, um, you know, drive accountability with that work. Thank you. Um... So we've talked about the importance of metrics, and I, I want to skip ahead to kind of the crux of this of this program. Um, can you tell us more specifically, what are the main areas of ESG that you work on for your company and why the general counsel's office should be so involved? We, we, we heard the survey results at the beginning of the hour about how boards uh, and investors uh, care very much about their companies uh, uh, meeting ESG standards and, and being good corporate citizens. But I'd like to ask you about some other areas of ESG that maybe your companies are getting involved in, such as human trafficking or uh, cybersecurity. Is that part of ESG? I, I think it is. So um, Kim, let's start with you. Um, can you tell us some of the other areas in which your law department is involved in ESG and how important it is for the law department to be a major player in ESG? Yeah, modern slavery and human trafficking are absolutely a priority for us. It is one of our um, areas that we uh, drive as far as ESG. Um, I can tell you that in the last year, uh, my role in particular has been leveraged quite heavily with respect to pay equity um, and also advancing our DE&I efforts, particularly with respect to um, uh, leadership accountability goals. We have specific goals that we have developed uh, as an organization to ensure that we are advancing women and people of color at the highest levels. Um, they are tied to compensation. So those are the areas that um, I've been working to uh, support. And, you know, there are very um, uh, important legal components to um, how we measure ourselves with respect to PAC how we monitor and set realistic goals with respect to advancing women and people of color. And that's really where I've been, um, my role has been uh, leveraged to support the ESG agenda. So those um, topics, human trafficking, modern slavery, in addition to uh, the things we sort of typically think of for DE&I uh, are all part of ESG then in, in your company. And I, I think they are, they should be uh, in all companies. Uh, Greg, what a, you've talked about some of the things that you get involved with with ESG, but I'd like to also talk about some of the things that we don't typically think of. Would you consider the COVID situation something that an ESG leader would uh, get involved in? Would you consider things like um, uh, occupational health and safety? Would you consider things like in the environmental part of E, you know, uh, disposal of products, um, cardboard shipping containers? Uh, how, can you give us a sense of some of those uh, issues and how you uh, manage them? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and I say that a, a lot of those do uh, either fall in a ESG program, or or definitely have a you know a, a significant role to play in it. So, so for example, um, yeah, I, I think um, you'd mentioned cybersecurity. You know th that that I think is also solidly uh, in ESG as well. I, I team up with our CIO, um, and we we basically we we happen to have a cybersecurity committee, and we, we co-chair that. Um, but but it's also very much in the ESG role because again, it is part of the the this, the governance of the company and and, and how we protect our data. But in terms of, you know, some of the other topics you mentioned, you know, um, disposal of, of, of equipment, right? We, we have uh, uh, one business line that essentially rents uh, IT equipment, right? And, and as we all know, we've all seen like the e-cycling response, you know, waste uh, turn-ins at, at Best Buys and what have you, right? We have that at a corporate level. We have to deal with that because we, we deal with tens of thousands of laptops, right? And, um, you know, we, we have a, a very successful used secondhand uh, sales channel um, that that we sell those things through, 
And one of the things we have to be very mindful of is, is that we don't sell those items to essentially what I'm going to call non-environmentally safe junkers, right? These are people that will just strip these pieces out, take the precious metals and just dump the rest of it on the shore of, you know, let's say India or wherever. So, so it's very important from a co corporate standpoint that we have processes in place, not just because it's good for the environment, but hey, you know, we're also all lawyers. It's illegal for us to do these things. And there are government agencies that will come after us if we do not properly behave. So, so it, it is a very direct concern in terms of legal exposure, but also again, kind of on the environmental and social sustainability that we want to be good corporate citizens. And, and that falls solidly within our ESG program. So, so those are some of the very specific things that we look at, particularly you know, in, in our, our you know, corporate governance policies. Did I hear you correctly? Uh, if I heard you correctly, that would mean that essentially all of us, a law department of one, could start improving ESG by considering how it disposes or how the company disposes of regular laptops and that sort of thing. Did I hear that correctly? Yes, absolutely. It's 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 all, you know, if you're a small or a large company, you know, you still have the same concerns and, and you, you want to make sure, like I said, you're acting as a, a good corporate citizen but also taking care of your company. And, and if you're, you know, I've, I've been a law department of one before, right? Um, luckily I have a team under me now, but you know, I've, I've been at the small companies where I'm like the only lawyer. And in fact, I was the first only lawyer with them, right? And, and it's, it, it's really about helping educate. Like a lot of what we need to do is, is actually education, particularly on the smaller company side, because the, you know, the business folks, the sales folks, maybe some of the operations folks, they're, they're, they're very generally technically you know, proficient in what they do, but they don't always see that bigger picture. And, and part of our role needs to be to help educate how things they may not be aware of can come in and impact their operations if we're not doing things the way we need to, be it you know, via goodwill from you know, the consumer saying, you know, I don't want to buy from this company because they just dump their stuff on the side of the road to you know, a government agency coming in to police them. So a, a lot... And this is what I really suggest is, is for the folks that are just getting to ESG is start with that educational component to help get that business buy-in from your business partners, right? Because if you just show up as the lawyer with a set of rules, they'll just be, yeah, yeah, whatever. Like you're, 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 you're imposing on business, you're slowing it down, we'll take the risk. But if you really help educate them upfront about why these things are important, and, and again, I always like to use specific examples with whatever company I'm in. So, so I encourage you to find some specific examples in your company, but really go to them as an educational outreach effort. And that really helps that buy-in for them to say, okay, that makes sense. What do I need to do now? W what should I be concerned about? And that, that kind of gets you in a really good position and on solid footing to then kind of roll out what are some of the things we should be doing in that ESG program. And, and even a discussion about, hey, what are some of the metrics, right? And, and again, do it as a partnership. Don't just say, hey, here's the things I research that you have to do. Ask them, what do you think? You know, does this metrics make sense? Or is there something perhaps I'm not thinking of? So, so, so I really encourage you, do as an outreach and then as a partnership. That's great. I, I can tell you in, in, in my career and my care about ESG topics, I would have loved very clear instructions that told me whether I should completely shut down my laptop at night and over the weekend or not. And I know there's a difference, but nobody told me what to do. So for those of you out there who um, are looking for a way to start, you could even start on very simple things like that or paper reduction, um, you know, again, printing on both sides. Uh, instead of using, this is a hard one for me, but instead of using the expandable paper folders and putting notes in other slimmer folders inside, you know, get rid of some of those folders. Uh, if you can write on both sides of a legal pad, if you have to write at all. So uh, those are those are kinds of things. And if you and if you measure them, it can actually add up quite a bit uh, from what I'm from what I'm hearing and learning. Um, you mentioned uh, both of you do do work, uh, your companies do work in other countries. Um, Kim, how are you finding um, the leading of ESG efforts in other countries, especially when it comes to things like environmental waste, when it comes to things like uh, D, E, and I, which we know is different in other countries than it is in the US, Canada, and 
probably Great Britain. So uh, how do you, how, what have you noticed about acceptance of ESG guidelines and responsibilities in other countries? So it's interesting because we do do um, quite a bit of surveying when we develop the ESG agenda, and this is on a global scale. So um, we do see a lot of similarities, um, a lot of shared priorities with respect to uh, workers' rights and environmental concerns. Um, there are different uh, priorities. I, I'd say that you know the U.S. is more people-centric with respect to um, some of the uh, primary concerns. The U.K. has more of a focus, and this is again just based on our uh, surveying on uh, environmental um, uh, rights and and uh, but also you know there's lots of cross. Um, functional or cross related uh, priorities as well. So um, I, I can say on a global scale, there's a shared interest and a, a common commitment to really uh, prioritize ESG efforts, uh, but there's a leaning, I think, um, more in the United States to uh, more people centric, uh, but again, uh, very common efforts, whether it's in the UK, Chile, Norway, uh, with respect to these areas. Are you finding any pushback on anything anywhere in the world? No, mm -mm, we haven't. Um, interestingly, uh, that isn't something, I mean, I, again, I haven't heard of any uh, pushback. And if anything, it's a, a shared mission that is really driven, you know, by our uh, global COO, um, who has a passion for advancing ESG. And so I think it's um, with her leadership has really helped to, you know, drive that, um, you know, across the globe. That's great. I will say that uh, diversity and inclusion, of course, are different in other countries. They mean different things. I mentioned that earlier. And uh, when I was in charge of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion for the law department of Aon, uh, there and Aon was careful about this itself, there were issues with countries like Singapore that don't recognize uh, gay rights. So um, we actually found a way to work legally with the regulations and with the regulators to define uh, what we were trying to do, uh, but not um, violate their laws. So if you really care about this subject, which I think all of us care about, um, you can find ways, but it takes extra work, I think. Greg, anything to add there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, one of the important things, um, Audrey, to your point, right, is, um, you know, your, your company's values, right? And, 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 and it's very important, first of all, every company should define what are your core values, right? And, and that's usually an exercise at the C-suite, you know, obviously generally, you know, led by the, the CEO, um, really needs to do, right? But but I think it's important that, you know, the ESG part is some way included in your core values as a company. And it's very important to go back to them. So Audrey, for example, your Singapore example, you know, I, I remember, you know, um, with, with domestic partnerships and those were first coming on the stage and and, and how did we, you know, as, 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 as legal professionals, you know, cope with that. And, and I think it's that same kind of concept where, you know, we, we operate, um, you know, we, we, we have uh, offices all around the world, you know, Asia, uh, Africa, um, Europe, you, you know, obviously here in the US, but, but you know, we, we want to make sure that we don't have, for example, like our Malaysian folks feel different than our folks in Germany or, you know, in Michigan, right? And, and, and we, you know, even though there are some legal differences in, for example, like equal pay, right? The UK Equal Pay Act looks a little different. The reporting is different than here in the US and the EEOCs, right? But, but it's important that you still try and harmonize how, as a company, you track those metrics, right? So, so yes, you might have to adjust some outputs here and there for local you know, government reporting, but I think internally, it's important for the company to decide what are the metrics we're tracking? How do we treat our people, you know, particularly on the, the, the social side here? But, but we should really base it on our core values as a company of, of you know, treating our folks with respect, treating them equally, and what does that mean? And, and that's kind of one of the things I always really encourage people to do is, is do it as a, you know, we're one whole company. We're not, oh, this is just the Singapore operations. Kim, anything to add? 
Totally agree. In fact, um, even with our leadership accountability goals, we have um, a global goal with respect to advancing women. Um, and we do have a US-based goal with respect to people of color, given the you know, differences with respect to DEI and how we measure ourselves. But um, you know, generally speaking, we try to harmonize wherever we can. And that shared mission, in this case, it's creating joyful lives through better health applies, um, you know, throughout the globe. That's great. Um, so I'm thinking, and my, my research and experience uh, has proven that following good ESG plans and improving your ESG should also help with employee attraction and retention. Mm -hmm. Do you have any stories about that or any evidence of that? I know um, many people these days will not or we'll ask at least on an interview about the ESG uh, environmental, uh, you know, programs of the company and so forth. Kim, you yeah, no, I've been asked directly that question. In fact, the first time it was asked of me, I was taken aback just because I don't know that I even had, you know, a, a great answer. It was several years ago, um, but you know, our company has certainly evolved in in that area, and it's something that's a priority for you know prospective team members, for our customers, for other external stakeholders. So, um, yes, absolutely, it makes us. It's the value add, hopefully, um, that we can ensure that we can continue to attract and retain, um, you know, uh, great team members. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and I'll second that, you know, I, I was actually talking to our, our U.S. recruiter the other day, and he, he probably once a week gets a candidate that asks him some version of what kind of ESG program does your company have? What does that look like, right? And, and it's one of the things where if you're not addressing it, that alone says something to the candidates, right? Like, oh, I don't know, or, or you know, if you don't have some a story to tell, that already is starting to turn off, you know. And and it's a very tight labor market right now. We all know this, right? Candidates are hard to come by, particularly good ones. So so I think it's very important in terms of just business operations to make sure that you're bringing in, you know, the quality candidates your business needs in whatever position they might be. That that's something a lot of people care about, and 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 you really need to have a story to tell them those folks. Otherwise, they will, you know, potentially pass on the opportunity. But you know, it also helps with employee retention. Same thing, just internally. Like these are folks who who right now could very easily go other places. And and why do they want to stay with your company? And, and this is one of those things. Again, a lot of people care about, and 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 we need to in, to ensure we're having you know the the correct folks in the correct positions, you know, address what their concerns are. And, and I, I, again, kind of going back to one of the points I made earlier, you know, it's just good practice to have something and be able to tell that story to folks, both internally and externally. Um, how would you recommend to a GC or somebody reporting to a GC who wants to help the law department's profile in a company, Kim, in your company, we'll start with, uh, could you give us one or two starting off steps as to how the law department can prove its value uh, by, by taking on more responsibility for ESG? I think it's being proactive with those conversations. If I think about how we were able to really uh, develop that partnership with our ESG and social responsibility partners, it was really just approaching them with the opportunity to really synergize, you know, create some synergies between the two functions and also help them support and advance their goals. Uh, just really trying to be a very um, good partner and um, understand, you know, what they're trying to accomplish from an ESG agenda perspective. And then, you know, helping them develop goals that really sets them up for success. Greg? Yeah, so, so you know, th th this is, I think, one of those classic examples where I would recommend you start small, right? Don't, don't show up with this giant, you know, everything included ESG program and expect to, to get it all implemented at once or everyone to buy in, right? You know, this, this is, particularly if, if your company really doesn't have an ESG program or, um, you know, ha has, has talked about it, right? You, you, you want to build on small success, right? So, so what I would do is, and, and every company is a little different, right? So I can't say always do this or always do that, but, but I think you need to look at your company to determine what things you think you can achieve fairly quick success 
you know, what, what are some of the low hanging fruit is a you know, kind of classic phrase, right? Um, and, and go from there. Um, but some of the, the types of topics are, are for example, you know, office uh, environmental stuff that we talked about, you know, the, the recycled paper, the energy saving, you know, those are things you can easily either talk to the IT department and, and say, hey, head IT guy, you know, can, can we implement, uh, you know, a system driven policy where the, the laptops automatically do these things? And generally the answer is yes, there's a lot of tools out there, you know, that they can, they can, you know, switch a couple settings and it happens, right? So that's a very easy one. Um, you can also, for example, uh, focus on with your HR partners, hey, what are some, again, not dealing with the entire effort of, you know, uh, diversity and inclusion, but like, what are some of the very specific steps? So, so one of the ones that might help is just focus in on the recruiting efforts, right? Um, what are some of the things we can do to help with our recruiting efforts to find those diversity candidates? And, and, and again, you know, th there are a lot of options and every company is a little different, but, but I think you need to actually, like I said, find some easy to succeed, you know, small steps to take first and you build on that success. And once people see that, they're, they're, they're becoming more used to the idea of ESG. They're becoming more used to you kind of leading that effort. And, and the other thing I'll say, right, just like with anything in life, you know, you're going to have some stumblings. You're going to have a failure here and there. Don't let that discourage you, right? Just, just regroup. Think about, okay, what went wrong? How can I, you know, better address it and then continue on? You know, an ESG program is, is like a journey, right? It's, it's, it's gonna take a lot of steps to get to what we'll call a mature level ESG program. You don't, you don't do it in six months, right? So, so be realistic with your planning, but don't let small obstacles or even small failures stop that effort. Just pick yourself up, you know, okay, what's the next thing I can focus on? What can I learn from the instance and keep going? And, and what you'll see is through that continuous effort, you will definitely see improvement and maturity um, grow both, you know, within yourself, within your department, but also within the company as a whole. Well, I would, that's great. And I agree with both of you hundred percent. And I would also recommend that, um, that people, law departments and GCs, uh, uh, you know, always want to enhance their value, right? We're not just the department of no, mm -hmm. <laughs> as some people used to think, we're not just the back office or a cost center, the law department. And I think uh, to follow up on what you said, both of you, I think if you, if the GC and the department took on uh, ES, meeting ESG goals as, as an actual stated goal and then carved out particular uh, metrics or areas, you know, I believe in smart goals, mm -hmm. you know, uh, achievable, measurable, etc. cetera. Um, I think that to your point, you could start finding things pretty quickly, whether it be checking that all of your supplier contracts have uh, an attestation that they don't uh, participate in any human trafficking, whether it be uh, figuring out that all of your department's um, candidate pools have uh, adequate diversity. Um, those things are measurable and they can make a big difference. I mean, and, and I would think that you're, I'm positive, that your board, your investors, and your CEO uh, have to appreciate that our law department is really helping the business here, really helping the company. And we're so, we're so proud of them. And here are the measurements to prove it. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. You know, um, one of the things, you know, where the legal department is naturally situated, right, is, you know, we get vendor contracts in all the time, right? And, and what, what I find very successful is not even, be, you know, before we even get the vendor contract in, but reach out to your business partners and say, here's a, here's a kind of a criteria of things we would like you when you look for vendors to ask about. Right? What are their ESG efforts? Do they have a you know anti-slavery human trafficking policy? You know, I mean, there's a couple of global standards that deal with that. You know, child labor as well, right? And and, and just 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 say, hey, you know, we really would like you to ask your vendors, do they comply with any of these standards? And and, and it's a small ask. Some folks will do it off the bat. Other times, you might have to remind them a few times, right? But but those are ways to help kind of shape that conversation from the beginning. So when 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 you you know get the contract in. You can say, hey, you know, you guys asked if they had an anti-slavery policy because I'm going to put that clause in. Is that a concern? And, and you've kind of already got the buy-in because they've already asked the vendor. So it's an easy win, if you will. Like you can slip it in. 
I know my guy's already good, right? So, so that's why, like I said, is, is if you can build a little bit at a time, it adds up very quickly. And by the way, to that point, uh, I have recommended um, to my clients uh, measuring the training. Who have, how many people have you trained? What countries have you trained them in? Because it's so wonderful to be able to prove that I trained you know, 1,000 employees in the country on um, how to deal with the uh, human trafficking or anti-slavery clauses or what to do with their uh, uh, technology and why or how to avoid uh, violating any anti-bribery laws, which we haven't even talked about, but are certainly part of governance. That training can be measured and can be can can really help the company not only defend heaven forbid claims because you've trained people, but to keep this dialogue going to Greg's point. Kim, did you have anything to add there? Yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, you know, we are always we're monitoring metrics with respect to unconscious bias training, other types of um, key ESG trainings, and we're celebrating it. We're writing about it in our ESG reporting as well. And Audrey, to your point earlier about, um, and Greg, about uh, contracting, I and mean, we've even, you know, embedded um, digital accessibility requirements in our contracts to really try to uh, ensure that our uh, technology is accessible to the visually impaired. So anything we can do to really um, bolster and, and really, you know, set that expectation uh, very early on in the relationship. Uh, we're, we're really helping to lead those, those discussions within the legal department. Yeah, that's super. And it's an affirmative plus for the yeah, law. And, 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 and honestly, one of the other things I would recommend, um, particularly for folks that are just kind of getting going, is there's a lot of inexpensive, we'll call, you know, online tracking tools, you know, um, that even small companies can afford, right? You know, I, I think I saw one the other day, it was like $12,000 a year subscription for an entire compliance program to track training and education and, and you know, incidences, right? There, so there's a lot of tools out there um, and, and, and don't let the tool take over, use the tool for the tool, right? But, but that really helps kind of show. And, and I think it's very important that the legal department report up right, to the board, to the CEO, to whomever that reporting structure looks like, not just, hey, because one of the problems we as lawyers always have, right, is, is you know, w w whenever we talk to someone, it's usually something bad happened, right? <laughs> Don't, I mean, I think it's really important. We encourage, you know, I encourage everyone to share the successes too, not just like, hey, I won the great lawsuit or I got this great contract to finally negotiate, but hey, I report, for example, to, to our entire C-suite and to the board, what we've done in terms of training. Here's our compliance training. So many people attended. This is what we did, right? The more exposure you can get the leadership team to these issues, the more they'll accept it, the more it becomes standard practice, the more support you'll get from them in your efforts. Right. And uh, we're going to have to wrap up because we, we want to take some ongoing questions um, from our uh, audience. Um, I, I do want to add kind of to tie a bow on this area of conversation that um, even though, uh, you know, there are employee handbooks and there are attestations, sometimes if there are stock options, there's restrictions based on your following company guidelines and so on and so forth. Um, I have found that training, educating, and discussions um, are as important as these kinds of paper agreements um, because for a number of reasons, not the least of which is, um, <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story. We did a, we did a, a, a training program on these kinds of things um, in a Central American country where we, where we did some business. And um, at the quest, one of the questions at that time from the audience was, well, I know the people in the US have to pay attention to this stuff, but like, it doesn't really pertain to us. So, you know, I'll sign the form, but I don't really even know what you're talking about when you're talking about this kind of thing. Well, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty illustrative to say, well, sorry, you're part of the company and it pertains to you, even if you're in a country that on the, you know, the hot, 
the measurement scale, the graph of which countries are the most uh, prone to bribery, uh, even if you're in one of those countries, you still have to follow our guidelines and so forth. So, and that's that was just an amazing question from the audience, uh, but it kind of illustrates that it's it's not just good enough to to say I'm complying or have it in the contract uh, as 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 a, as a, as a routine templated term. You also have to explain to people what it means mm -hmm. and how they can uh, deal with it and enforce it. Um, are there any additional questions from the audience that haven't been? Um, you know, written in in the Q&A section or uh, that you want to raise right now? Okay. I know that we've had a couple of audience questions on some of the terminology we've been using, some of the acronyms and so forth. Um, we do keep a copy of these chat uh, questions and somebody, one of us will get back to you with those uh, more specific questions so that, uh, you know, it's because that the, they might not be relevant to everybody. But um, I do want to thank our speakers, Kim Metrick and Greg Wilkinson for this incredible variety of perspective, opinion, and acknowledgement uh, at how they're leading uh, ESG and their companies and how important it is for the leaders of the company, the investors of the company, the customers. We heard uh, especially from Kim in the pharmaceutical industry, the, you know, she's in a, in, in a business that serves, gives direct to the customer, has direct B2C um, uh, components, how important it is now. And um, I think it's fascinating and I, and I wish you uh, all a good journey with um, improving the ESG in your company and elevating your own profiles. Thank you, well, Bob. Th uh, thanks so much for um, uh, Kim and, and Greg and Audrey for, for sharing this information today. Uh, hopefully uh, you got uh, quite a bit of information out of this. Again, we'll be sending information uh, out so you have access to this recording. Um, and obviously if there's anything that, that Audrey can do to assist you, uh, whether it's executive coaching or if there's any type of advising to, to support you and in, in, uh, your legal and compliance department, uh, you have her contact information here and I'm happy to, uh, to assist in any way as well. Uh, as well as uh, any, you know, any executive uh, searches that, uh, that you may have uh, a need for your teams. Again, uh, Kim, Greg, thanks again. And uh, thanks for everyone's attendance today. Have a great day. You will.